more people that are kind of trickling down. I apologize for the change. So um, I had no idea that this was going to happen as well, but we got pushed out at the last minute. Um, apparently there was uh, some non-communication that happened at FIT today, which is, you know, never happens. So welcome to Faces and Places in Fashion here. We're back in the Katie Murphy for good, so we don't have to move again. So I just wanted to let you know that uh, ahead of time. Uh, real quick uh, house cleaning things. You, we do have your event critiques are due today. So those are two of them. I've, I've checked in today. It looks like most of you have gotten them up. So if you haven't, just make sure you have until midnight to get those up uh, for that assignment. And uh, next week, as a reminder, Sylvia Heisel, who is the head of the uh, 3D Lab here in New York City, is going to come speak about high, uh, high performance textiles, 3D, um, kind of rethinking everything from a tech point of view. Um, so. We're going to change things up a little bit today, but we'll kind of let you know as we go throughout this time. But I'm really excited to have uh, the founder of Fluid Project, Rob Smith, with us here today. Thank you so much for coming to FIT. <laughs> I do want to give you a little bit of a background on Rob. Um, we uh, chatted uh, probably about six months ago. I spoke with his PR uh, team, and we thought it would be a really great opportunity to have Rob come in and speak about this project that he's working on. But Rob also comes with a vast amount of experience in the fashion industry. I uh, just wanted to hit on a couple of things. Um, he come, he's a highly accomplished senior executive, entrepreneur. He's a board member. Uh, he's worked for 30 years in the apparel industry, fashion, sports goods, and merchandising. Um, he has worked for brands such as Haddad, uh, Levi's, Nike, Jordan, Converse. Uh, he also worked at uh, Victoria's Secret, directing $600 million apparel, shoe, and accessory business for the catalog and online distribution. He worked 20 plus years at Macy's, led a team of six VPs and 75 executives, successfully merging four operating divisions into one division and delivering sales and profit growth. Um, he is on the board of uh, Steve Madden, um, that's got to be an exciting board meeting to go to. <laughs> I've been in his office before. <laughs> among, among other uh, boards such as the Athlete Ally Action Awards, um, the Hetrick Martin Institute, and the HMI Emory Awards, which I just mentioned. Um, he has a bachelor's degree in marketing uh, and marketing management from the Michigan State University. So again, welcome to Rob. Thank you so much for coming today. Um, and he taught at FIT right, in the business uh, merchandising program. Before we jump into this today, we're going to show uh, a video, a quick video, and I think not many people have seen this yet, right, Rob? All right. as a retail executive and had a really fulfilling, wonderful yep. career. At the same time, CEO and founder of The Fluid. Start back again. Here we go. Hey, my name is Rob Smith. I am the CEO and founder of The Fluid Project. I have a, about a 30 plus year experience as a retail executive and had a really fulfilling, wonderful career. At the same time, it wasn't fulfilling enough because at night I was finding other opportunities to fill my soul. And it just finding and working with marginalized young people was really fulfilling. But I thought there was an opportunity to have a more altruistic life and to merge the two. I didn't know what it was, so I put in a backpack and decided to go on a journey to learn about ancient culture and ancient civilizations and just immerse myself. So my first stop was Guatemala, then I went on to Peru. After Peru, I went on to India, Nepal, and Tibet, where I studied ancient religions and cultures. And then I came back and I closed the trip up. I brought my mom to the Ojibwe Reservation where her grandma was born. And it was a great way to wrap it up because I learned about the two spirits in Native American culture, the combination of male and female power in this third gender. They were the most revered and often became shamans. I had the opportunity to do a really in-depth spiritual exercise. And in that process, a lot was revealed about who I am and where I came from. And the same process, the Fluid Project was born. There's a lot in the name, and there's a lot of time spent on the names. Fluid is really important because it's about living a life without being stagnant or stuck in one place, about flowing and ebbing and moving. 
And I think we should all live a life that way. It also reflects the, our view on gender and this space in between the binary. We had a pH on the beginning, and pH represents the balance. And life balance is one of our core values. And in this case, it's also a balance of masculine and feminine. And then we added a project at the end because we realized this is a work in progress, that we are joining a movement, a movement that's happening right now, especially with young people rejecting the binary. They're looking for a place where they can come and experience a place free of judgment, a place that they can express themselves openly. It's a non-gender specific retail space, so we are the world's first gender food store. So it starts off there, but it's more than that. Uh, we also have a coffee shop, a place for people to hang out. We have a community space in the lower level where people can meet and hang out together. And then we have events. We have talks and speakers and fundraisers. Every single day, we're creating something, working together and sharing ideas. It really makes the world a better place, that's all I can say. It's great to peel it back and look at all of the things that it is. What brands we use, what speakers we use, what charities we align with. We really want to challenge boundaries of humanity and do that in everything we do and every way we do it. And that's, that's the foundation of who we are. And then we have our, our uh, values. And our core values are acceptance, balance, integrity, intention, and openness. And then we also have a social code. It's how we ask people to show up. So we check our assumptions at the door. We realize that we're all teachers and we're all students. And we ask people to listen and communicate with care. This moment in my time and my life that all roads have led up to this point, and it couldn't be more of an honor than to um, represent the community and to offer what I know and what I have and to share with the people that we share it with every single day and I'm grateful for that. How many of you have been to the Fluid Project by raise of hands? Okay, so this is for some of you, you've seen it before, and for those of you who haven't, you're going tonight, right? <laughs> your, your mic's off. Cool. Yeah, the, the sizing, um, uh, so one of the things, one of the, uh, I'll get to sizing in a second, but that's a good point. Um, so anyways, if, if you do me a favor, just pull your phone out and then ask you to put it away if you don't mind. But, but, uh, <laughs> but just put in fluid in Instagram or Facebook if you're a Facebook and PHLUID, we should come right up, hit follow, and you'll learn a lot about the stuff we do. That's so funny. <laughs> Are you on Facebook? We won't make fun of you. <laughs> Before we jump into fluid, because I, there's clearly so much to talk about there, I just wanted to hit, you have such an interesting background, and, I, and, and you have taught here at FIT, and you're, you've been a merchandiser and, and an executive. Can you just kind of walk us through a little bit about sort of your um, experience in the fashion industry and um, kind of leading up to kind of this big change? Sure. Um, so I grew up in Michigan, Detroit, and I went to Michigan State. And I was a marketing major. I was going to go work for Procter & Gamble. That's what everyone did. And kind of horrified me because it was in Ohio, and I just <laughs> wanted to get the hell out of Michigan. And um, I got this, like, phone call. You know, I think the universe works in ways it can't explain. But somebody called me up from a company called Burdines, which is a department store based in Florida, and said, hey, we heard you're interested in Burdines. And we just had a cancellation. Can you come for an interview tomorrow at 3 o'clock? And, and it was March, and there was like this much snow on the ground in Michigan. And I rode my bike to the library, because that's what he did back then, and I pulled out a book out on Bird Eines, and it was a department center in Florida. And I went in the interview, and I knew nothing about retail, but um, she liked me, so she flew me down for the second interview, and they offered me a job. And I'll never forget, like, it was $18,000 and a $500 signing bonus. I called my dad. I'm like, Dad, I got a job. <laughs> I told him what it was and how much I made, and he was not happy. But um, it turned out to be really good. Yeah. So you started at Burdines, and then you kind of got into merchandising from there? Yeah, so then it? I went, it was in the training program. Then I went to stores. I only spent about six months in stores, and then I went to became a buyer mm -hmm. for junior dresses, and then I moved up to being a vice president. And I was kind of a hot shot. I was the youngest vice president at 
at oh, wow. um, Federated Inc. Macy's, and then I wanted to become the youngest executive vice president at 34 uh -huh. at Macy's, and then, yeah, kind of worked my way through Miami, LA, San Francisco, New York, and um, I had it, like one time I had about almost a third of the whole, all of buying from Macy's, so it was like about, I don't know, billions, billions of dollars, I lost count, but it was, it was, a, it was great, and then I decided I wanted to keep growing, so I left. I went to Victoria's Secret and wanted to learn vertical, which is where you manufacture your own clothes, and I wanted to learn e-commerce, so I got both at victoriasecret.com, and then they fired me, um, which was cool because it was a year severance pay. I, I couldn't work for a year, but that's when I taught Sometimes that's the best way. <laughs> yeah, like, okay, I mean, it sucked, but, 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 it, but it was... Uh, it turned out to be great because it brought me to my next job, which was merchandising all of kids for Levi's and Nike Global, and that taught me global experience and and just working with other great brands. And then, then I went to Burning Man. Does anyone know Burning Man? They always say, "Don't quit your job after Burning Man." I went to my first Burning Man. I quit my job. I came back. I said, "I, I just, I really liked who I was there. Nobody knew who I was." what my title was, anything that just liked me for me, and I wanted to live a life like that. So I gave the company five months, and that's when I started my journey. Uh, and the Fluid Project was born in Peru on April 14th of 2017. I went through this shamanic ceremony, and I wrote down in the morning, consider opening a gender-free, non-binary shopping environment. And I wrote Fluid, though I spelled it wrong then, um, in quotation marks. Yeah. Aha. Was there ayahuasca involved? It was ayahuasca yeah. involved. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Tried to skirt around that issue, but yeah, yeah. I was high in DMT. <laughs> but it's so fascinating because you're, you're kind of hitting on a couple of things. One, you moved around quite a bit mm -hmm. and got to know customers and stores and location. And you also clearly worked with product a lot. Yeah, you know, there, I got to the point, especially at Macy's when I was in merchandising and it was there, and I was, I was on the track to become the C-level executive and... It was a really hard decision just to say, you know, I think I've learned everything I could learn here and then to move on. Um, but they, they, they also wanted me to, I remember they gave me a coach mm -hmm. that was the speaking coach, but then they, they pulled up pictures of other executives and showed me how they were dressed, how their haircut was cut, how wide their ties were, how, how not pointy their shoes were, and that they weren't wearing poochie ties, and I wasn't. They, they, just, they basically wanted me to be something that I wasn't, and I was like, that's when I have to get out of here. Yeah. It's surprising how, I mean, when I talk to like students who are incoming into fashion, there's sort of this idea that it's very diverse and inclusive, and it, it's getting more, but it's it still is, a yeah. fairly... There's a bunch of straight white guys yeah. running the company, yeah. And yeah. even like you go into like the, like the head of buying for women's was a maybe a gay white guy, who knows, you know, but, <laughs> but that was me, I guess, that was, <laughs> that was a gay white guy. Um, <laughs> It, you know, it, it's getting better, but, you know, the retail is the one place you thought would be the most diverse. But even if you think about female designers in the f women's business, like, there's so few. There's so many male-dominated, female-dominated business and design. So just, and then you get to the CEOs of the companies. The women aside, when there are women, there's usually a male uh, CEO. It's just, it's, it's shockingly how um, gendered it is, and gendered meaning in the cis white male world. Mm -hmm. And it's so fascinating because so many designers obviously are not, um, but then they kind of go through these different layers before their work finally hits the retail and then it, it kind of is devoid of any queer perspective in a way. Yeah, your queerness gets watered down in fashion yeah. for sure. Yeah. Um, so what was it in Peru besides the ayahuasca <laughs> that, that sort of made you write that down? I mean, because Does anyone know what ayahuasca is? <laughs> Yep. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> if you don't know, it's uh, you, you're in a safe space with a shaman, and you you have a liquid form, which is a uh, it's a liquefied um, plant, and you drink it, and, and it tastes uh, horrible, but it um, opens your mind, and you have uh, an experience that can answer questions that have been um, either suppressed and experiences that are suppressed, so you kind of relive experiences that you might not have wanted to experience again, but do because it's part of your growth. And I did it um, seven times and then another, wow. yeah, I got a lot of answers. But, yeah. the, but the one night I went with like, what was, what was my purpose in life? It was very clear what I was supposed to do with my life. And this is it. It's interesting. So, so the, no looking back once that came. I mean, yeah, I just, I was on a, I remember I was on a, I was on a train for an interview 
before that, I was on my way to Burlington for a big job, and it was in Burlington, New Jersey, and it was, I started to, like, cry. I'm like, I can't do this. Like, I can't do unless I did me, and so I'm doing me now. Mm -hmm. So what was it about gender-free? Was that something that you had been thinking about? I mean, it was sort of in the back of your mind, or was this something that just I, kind of surprised I think you? I kind of, in the back of my mind, it was there just the idea that I always wanted to create my own retail concept store. My, my first store was called The Fringe, mm -hmm. And the idea was during like Abercrombie, Era Pastel, American Eagle days when everyone looked the same, I wanted to create a really cool store in the mall for people that were on the fringe of being cool. Because I felt like everyone was cool, but I always feel like the people on the verge, the, the outside of being cool, right. were going to be the kids that moved to LA and New York right. and, you know, are the cool kids. But I wanted to create a space for them to say like, you're on the fringe, but ultimately you're going to be the coolest kid in town when you move out of this place. Um, <laughs> But then malls died, and and then and then uh, I don't know. Just this idea, like it, it was just so clear to me through the, especially working with Hedrick Martin, which if you know, but is the uh, LGBT after school program in New York, the world's first after school program for LGBTQ uh, kids, and home of the Harvey Milk High School, which is the world's only uh, queer high school, and um, is a transfer school for for queer kids and trans trans kids, and. Um, it just was like, it all kind of came together that this was taking what I love and what I love and putting it together. And also mixing in a little activism, which is also what I love because I believe the only way to equality is by sometimes standing and screaming, whether with your voice or a t-shirt or whatever way you can to make a difference. And God knows we need that right now. I mean, you must have known that, I mean, anytime something doesn't exist, like a gender-free yeah. retail store, that there's typically two reasons, one, because nobody wants it, right? Or yeah. two, because nobody's willing to fund it or talk to you about it. Or so, what, what did you find when those you? Are, those are yeah. So every every day I hit a wall, you know. So the first wall started for when I found the space. I was like, great! I found the space in August. I signed the lease in September, and I went to a trade show to find product. And it was the men's section and the women's section. Like it became binary immediately, and then. It was like the men's was all sooty and like stuffy clothes and the women's was all florally like pastel and I was like, oh man, there's nothing to buy. So I started merging some lines together like brands like Fila and Levi's and Champion, like mixing the men's and women's line together, which was kind of fun. And then I realized I had to buy and make our own product and then find, use two fit models, you know, making our own product but not knowing what the customer wanted. So we started off really safe and we're veering away from safe because our customer doesn't want to be safe. So, so when you... In product, you right. know, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So you signed a lease, and then how, how quick before Fluid opened? I mean, this is... Uh, September, October, November, December, January, February, March. So six months later. Wow. Yeah. Okay. And fast. you started your own sort of line as 50 well. 50% <laughs> of the product was our own. Like, literally, wow. like, went into action and made our own product. We, that, was, that was, I guess, the, the good thing about having the history of manufacturing is I knew... How to get stuff done. How to do done. that. Yeah. 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 Did, I mean, you acted surprised when you went to these shows. I mean, but clearly you, you've, you've been in the industry for a while, but it, was it sort of coming from that perspective or that yeah. frame of I, mind? I had never gone in and always been like, I'm looking for the juniors, like buying right. area. The, you know, I've never gone in with this headset of, and it's just, a, and once you get into this headset of realize how, how completely like messed up we are around, you know, separating men and women and everything we do, once you become aware of it, you realize how prevalent it is and just and how hard it is to peel it back and undo it. And that's what I try to do every day is to, um, the, my first goal is to eliminate gender expression from anything, you know, just even going to foreign countries. And when I was in India and I see, would see, you know, men in skirts and in dresses and holding hands and they weren't getting beat up, you know, they were just, they were just, that's what you wore and it's just in you know gender is a social construct it's what you you know decide in your society you know going to Burning Man I, I by three days in like typical you know cis men were were start off like in day one in cargo shorts and a t-shirt by day three they were in tights and tutus and makeup and just you yeah, realize like how society allows people to act a certain way or be a certain way it's just fascinating how quickly it can be, how quickly it changes mm -hmm. in a safe environment. It's such an inter interesting thing when you kind of get into like queer theory and, and fashion and all these things because there's this concept of visibility and invisibility. And I can imagine as you were sort of getting started, like 
you know, being queer is many different things. It's yep. sort of everything and, and nothing if, if in, in the sort of sense that you described. So how do you, how did you sort of start thinking about a point of view that you wanted to get across in the store, but also be inclusive? It's, that's a tall order. There's a, yeah, there's a, there's a lot in that question. So I'll tell you the first thing we did was we created a, a mission statement. And whenever you start something new, you create a mission statement. It gives you a, like a framework to like make decisions. So our, our mission statement is to challenge boundaries with humanity. So what that means is challenge boundaries in everything, like question everything, you know, turn everything upside down. Why is this this way? Why do we do this? And then do it with humanity. Because I thought very quickly it could be a, a place where anger surfaces as opposed to humanity and compassion. So it, um, you know, it would be really easy to put fuck Trump t-shirts on the floor and watch them sell. But instead, you know, we're doing our version, which is fucking vote and fucking spelled PH. They're selling really well right now. Um, but how do you do it? How do you do it in a way that's with humanity, not done through aggression? And I think in any way you can come with that perspective of creating a safe space for everyone. And, and it is a safe space for everyone. I made blue shirts and red shirts. So everyone feels empowered to know this is a space for them. And then how did that translate into sort of an external or a visual statement for the store? Because it is very, it has a very strong point of view when you walk into the store, but at the same time, it does have an expansiveness to it that is Yeah, hard. so we try to make it, um, first of all, I use all white fixtures and tried to do white floors, white walls, so everything product spoke for itself. Although someone was very clever, they said, if you're really inclusive, why are all your mannequins white? And I thought that was a really yeah. insightful thing because I just wanted like a white palette, but you know, it just was interesting. Um, yeah, always uh, the good thing about feedback through social media is people are com completely honest and I love that. Brutally. But really, yeah. but it's wonderful. Um, but I wanted the idea of like a blank canvas and we actually created, I wanted to find gender free mannequins and realize that they don't exist that every mannequin was as gendered as possible. So the, the male mannequins had broad shoulders, a big chest, and like just rocking bodies. And, and you know, women were like big boobs and small, it just nothing was real. So I took a mannequin that was a female intimate apparel mannequin that had kind of big shoulders and readjusted every um, chest or breast to be modified. So it looked like normal shoulders and a modified chest. and a, too small waist, I'll say that, but it had a great butt, and I don't know who doesn't want a great butt. <laughs> Keep the great butt, right? <laughs> it's kind of universal. Like everyone wants a good butt. One day when I was in there, I noticed lots of different types of people will walk in. Yep. Um, I, if, in this day, it was uh, tourists. It was a, a mom yep. and two girls, and I think about halfway through, they're like, wait, there's no there's no size and gender in here. And the yeah. mom, mom kind of blew her mind a little bit. The kids got really excited. Um, but, but in a way, there is sort of an inclusive feeling when you walk in. You yeah. don't really notice, but then you do. It's, it's for everybody, and it's like half of the people that come in the store are tourists. They just, they see that they're like the world's first gender-free store. They're like, let's go check this out. We try to be very like, we wait till you get to the harnesses until you get to the back of the store, <laughs> but like the front of the store is very like kind of t-shirts and jeans and like, oh, this is cute. And then you get to the back of the store, it gets a little more aggressive with caftans and and dresses and big chunky patent leather shoes that are size 13, you know. We don't, we don't open with that because we want people to walk in to get comfortable, but then we want people to get to the back and for, you know, people like myself to start experience, experimenting with makeup, you know, for the people to start like, maybe I will try in a caftan today. I don't know, we want people to get into the middle of the store, the back of the store, until they start to like process this and start to experiment. And that's when Things get really fun. And well, there's also a coffee shop back there too. Yep. So by the time they're getting back, it's a little more aggressive, but also yep. more community. Sure. Yeah. I think, and you touched on the community. That's a big part of who we are. We're actually half retail, half community. So if you follow us on social media, find out just this week we're doing a weekly calendar and we're doing a gypsy sport takeover. So Jacob, who's here, everyone says Jacob. Jacob <laughs> work, goes to FIT <laughs> and is um, one of our rising stars. Started off in sales and I was running our social media and events, doing a killer job. So you're welcome, um, <laughs> really proud of you. And um, the thing that we're doing this week is we've got four cocktail parties and one event this week, right? Yep, 
So when it's a community space, it's uh, fundraisers, uh, vent launches of brands and designers. Every Tuesday, we have an open door policy from 11 to 12 where we have new brands come in and we can't find everyone, but they can find us and they share their designs. And I would say 75% of the time, we give them a chance to launch their brand in our store and they get a space and we have it for a day or a week. And last month, we had sex toys for a day. That was a lot of fun. <laughs> And then we worked into a panel discussion about sex positivity. Mm -hmm. We took four women, one trans, one body positive, one dominatrix, and one um, adult uh, film star and producer. And we had a conversation around sex and de-shaming sex, uh, especially from a female point of view. And that was awesome. Um, next week, we have a panel discussion on the conversation around um, the transgender and non-binary experience with four really interesting people and talking about what it's like on social media, what it's like to walk down the street, you know, how, do, how is it to be transgender and non-binary in this environment and what's the experience like? It's so surprising how very little thought is put into that thought. I mean, we talk a lot about bathrooms, for example, being gendered or non-gendered and but we don't even talk about it from a store perspective. And you, you mentioned the trade show, but you walk into any department store in Uniqlo, yeah. there's a women's floor, there's a men's floor. I even say, like, <laughs> the, when you go into a website, the first thing you do is you click men's or women's. Like, it's the first thing we do every single day, all the time. And, it, and once you become aware of it, you're like, wow, this is really fucked up. But I spelled fucked up the right way, because that was... <laughs> so it's okay. We say fuck here anyway. <laughs> okay. So... <laughs> I told them that day one, right? Uh, <laughs> um, but how? Let's go back to the sort of visibility and visibility, because in many ways, sort of this idea of gender-free that kind of—I'm not. This is the wrong word to use, but whitewash, or it sort of becomes in gender-free. There's a lot of like sportswear, right? Baggy clothes, things yeah. that don't define, and yet in many ways for queer people, it's the exact opposite. They want to define and right. self-express. So that was, that was the first, when I started looking at brands that had done gender-free, and uh, by the way, I'm gonna just use the word gender-free and tell you how I got there. There was unisex, but you gotta take sex out of it because it's about gender. Then there was gender-less, and I hated that word because it's not less, and there was gender-neutral, which was commonly used, and there was gender-free, which to me, celebrated gender as being free and self-expressive. So that's what we settled on was gender free. And that's, and then, but I started looking at capsules done by Zara and H&M and a couple, even that a mess of an Abercrombie children's one they did. And it was very, um, just either, it were the colorless, shapeless pieces or very masculine like hoodies and sweatpants. And it was nothing interesting at all. So we opened with color, we opened with, um, you know, and, and it's hard to do. I mean, when you're looking at like, uh, you know, uh, sex and birth, male body, sex and birth, female body, you're dealing with different shapes. You do your best because even when you get to like a women's department, like sometimes you ever see those t-shirts that shape like this. Mm -hmm. I don't know who can fit into those because they're like, <laughs> they're just, it's, it's absurd. Glass. It's the, our idea of femininity, yeah. what a woman looks like, but it's just, it's hard to undo it all. But once you undo it and start to learn, it just was, it was really exciting. But we opened up with a, ton of color. Um, it was really exciting. But try to like just break apart that stereotype that gender neutral is just gray, oversized, ugly clothes. Right. Or expensive. You or mentioned expensive. that earlier that you ha there are brands like Rad Harani and uh, others who are spelt, yeah, Telfar Global. Uh, but they're selling at an extraordinarily high price point, which then limits yep. the customer who you wanted to walk into your door. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, so when I decided to go to price points, my, my goal was that if a young person walked in the store and if they had $100, and I know working with young people, a lot of people don't have $100. Some people have got $10,000, but some people don't have 100 But if they did have 100 if they were able to spend some money, they could walk out with four things from our store. They could fill a bag with eyeliner, a T-shirt, maybe a fanny pack, and something else, and feel good about that. You know, the concept of building a st store for you know, young, queer, non-binary, trans, or allied people, um, and being at $1,000 seemed absurd to me. And I got, I got a lot of, um, from magazines and, and um, people in the space gave me a tough time because I wasn't supporting those designers. Um, not that I wouldn't and haven't spoken to them, but it didn't feel like the right way to launch this business model being completely elitist in pricing although I, I do have respect for them and would like to work with them, but just didn't feel like the way to open the brand. 
Right. When you and you're in four walls, you're you're a brick and mortar, so yep. you have to pick and choose the brands that you're you're going to have in there. Yep. And they walked in the store and they chose not to sell us, which is fine. They mm-hmm. just didn't think their price point fit into it, and but we're still hopefully going to have a conversation to figure a way to do it some way. Right. And so it's already mentioned size um, and fit, which are two different things yeah. here. But how how did you go about sort of dealing with that issue? Because I mean, first of all sizes don't even really mean that much in the fashion industry to begin yep. with. But then when you start to talk about it from a gender free point of view, how did you tackle that? Yeah, you just had to break everything apart. So we had to, um, first of all, I wanted to eliminate words that could body shame somebody. So I, w- I eliminated words like extra small and extra large and replaced them with words like uh, or numbers, like numeric system. So zero through four. Um, now we've gone up to five and six and did zero zeros. Um, but I found it also made things incredibly complicated because people are like, wait, you're gender free and it's a size three. They're like, what the fuck? Like, what, what size am I? So we are trying to play around with a few sizes to see if it makes a difference. But um, when we designed, we designed with three things in mind. One, sustainability. The shirt's made of organic cotton in the United States, screen printed by a local screener that um, teaches young marginalized kids how to teach a skill. So that's who we work with. Um, we design for solutions, so we try to find solutions for whether you're non-binary or transgender, like design for solutions like a binder and type of pieces, and then design um, for inclusion. So we try to use inclusion, like how can we include as many people as possible in design um, aesthetic. So those are the things we work on and think about. We're creating, we're launching our, the, our gender-free gene, which is pretty awesome this um, December. Yeah, so we try to design with intention and try to break everything apart and disassemble things and put it together all over again. I remember the first time I walked in, the first question I got is, have you ever been here? And then the second question was, is what do you typically wear? What's your, you know, and then yeah. they gave me some, you know, examples of sizes that might I, I like to direct people to the, which posh uh, spice girl are you are. Like, are you sporty spice or are you posh spice? So it's the spice girl section. <laughs> I think that's pretty good. <laughs> yeah, <it's> just, <laughs> yeah they we're, all, we're all Spice Girl. So, I mean, you talked a little bit about going in and not seeing brands that, fit, you know, that were too binary, that were the Paisley or the florals, and then men's were suiting. So how was it going after brands and sort of having these conversations? Because I'm sure in some cases, brands that you ended up buying had no idea that they were going to end up in a They did. You store. Know, it's a great story. So one of the brands, I can't tell you who it is, but... Like when I did it, they were like, I kind of did it on the side, and then I don't know. They, they ended up on the floor, and the CEO found about it, and then and walked in the store. Was like, kind of blew his mind that this kind of older cisgender white guy, you know, typical CEO of a company, was like, wow, this is our men's and women's line merchandise together, and saw the selling and was like blown away. I got to tell you, they already. I just saw it last week. They created a special capsule for us for Pride. It's um, it's 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 co-branded with them, and they're like it's the beginning of many many co-branded uh, products. I think we'll start doing because people are now like, wow, that's freaking cool. So do you think I that didn't say that, fuck that time? Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> do you think that uh, some of the brands that you've worked with are now starting to think about design differently because there's you at the end of? I think. I mean, it's just going to be really hard for anyone. I think they're talking about it. I can tell you that they come in our store a lot. You know, they come in groups of 30, and I'm like, where are you from? <laughs> They're trying to be sneaky, and then I usually get it out of them. They'll be from Target or from Abercrombie or from Macy's, and they're just checking it out and trying to figure out how they could get their, their organization to get behind this. I think I just saw that um, American Eagle is launching a gender-free, whatever, gender-neutral uh, concept. We'll see how their execution yeah. is. Yeah. And so is ASOS, I think, right? The co- collusion. ASOS is doing a great job. Yeah, they're... Yeah. They're really good. I have a lot of respect for them. Do you think that there's a, a, a shift hap- happening away from sort of what's typically called rainbow washing, you know, of, of corporations, include, fashion included, who are looking at more of a pride event versus actual human beings who are looking for clothes that fit? Yeah. I mean, yes. Yeah, well, first of all, there's my obsession with like this whole like pride bandwagon that everyone creates a t shirt for pride and gets behind it. And then on July 1st, it comes down. And we're, we're proud all year long. And I think I encourage people to support gay-owned and operated businesses when they buy a gay pride product. I think it's pretty important to do that. Um, 
not to let the commercialization of the celebration um, take over the people that are putting their hearts and their their souls and their life into it. So, um, first choice, buy a gay-owned and operated business, uh, support one way, buy Pride product or Pride in general. Same with women-owned businesses. Um, but we do like corporate money. I think it's nice to see corporations spend money on it. It does feel good. Mm-hmm. Um, but I forgot where it's going. But I do want to announce something which is kind of exciting. Okay. It's not official, but um, World Pride is happening this June, if you know that or not. Everyone know that? It's the Stonewall 50th anniversary. And World Pride is for the first time ever going to be in the United States in New York City. And the Fluid Project's been selected as the retailer for World Pride, which is pretty exciting. exciting. Congratulations. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Um, That's a round of applause, I think. Yes, it's let's big, do. It's a big fucking deal. <laughs> That's a pretty important thing. And I was going to mention, too, that you um, ended up on the front page of the style section at New York Times, which um, I know there was a lot of work to get that um, with your team, but how did that change the conversation? Because that's got to that's no, gotta put it in front of... It's nothing changes. It's so funny. Like, every time you think a big article comes out, we had twice the New York Times style section twice in a month, uh-huh. and they keep waiting like for people to walk in the door. <laughs> So they're not buying Nobody because of it. <laughs> and, uh, it's the and, groups from Target. This yeah. <laughs> I mean, the, the Fox episode did a lot better than the New York Times. More people came in from that. But yeah, I mean, we were in New York one. More people saw New York one probably did. But there, and if you've been in a taxi cab, we're in taxi cabs this week. That's actually gotten the most reaction from being in taxi cabs, which is really cool. It's surreal to be in a taxi cab and see your face. You're like, it's me. <laughs> I tell the taxi driver, like, I am on TV back here. As if they gave a shit, you know. They give you a it's discount. Me. <laughs> it's me. Do you? I mean, you've you've become in many ways, and this isn't the way it started, which you had mentioned to me earlier. But you're becoming the face of this conversation in retail and fashion. Um, maybe talk why you chose not to be sort of the face early on, and then sort of flip over to the other side and talk about how it is now to be yeah. at the forefront of this conversation. Yeah, it's great for the video. So the reason I made this video like two weeks ago, first of all, it feels a little um, narcissistic just watching it, but the intent was to share with um, speaking engagements so I could be a speaker because I, when I speak to my peers, I like educating them about the idea, so it was done for them. But I didn't want to share my story for until Fluid was six months old because I want to give Fluid a chance to be its own brand and be have its own legs and not to, not to have another cis white man be the leader of another movement or of uh, something happening. So I wanted Fluid to have its own voice and be its own thing before somebody saw me show up because it deserved that. So it wasn't that I didn't feel like I could do it or want to do it or believe in myself, but I wanted it to have its own own voice before my voice came in. But my voice is, is that of Fluid. It's just I figured some people might want to listen if they saw me. Has it changed your life at all in terms of how people see you in in the queer community, but also outside? Or I, I, maybe, yeah. I mean, I don't know. It's it's what I've always done. It's I've I've always thrown myself in to support the community. I think we can't discount. You know, uh, I was on the board of Hedrick Martin, the and we always struggle with having too many gay white men on the board because that's who showed up, and we're trying to get a diverse board, but. That was always the issue, is gay white men always showed up. Um, I, I found out why, because at least for women too, I think women identify as women first. I think as a gay man, sometimes you don't know where else to identify than being gay, so that's kind of the natural place to go. Um, I certainly think, you know, you know, um, yeah, it's that or a golf club, I guess. <laughs> I, I, you know, it just felt like that's why there's so many gay white men, and certainly if you're a person of color, you come from other um, places, there's a lot of opportunities for you to get back. This feels like the place where me and my friends get back. Um, so, but listen, I've ed- been educated through this whole process. I'm much more articulate than I am was before. I still have, I teach like the gender unicorn class if you ever want it. I'm really good, I can, I'm getting good at it teaching gender unicorn. My friends and colleagues are at my age, they just can't get their head around. They're like, they, for two years, they can't say them as a pronoun. I'm like, you could have learned a whole nother language in two years if you, you know, as opposed to just learning how to say one word. It just shocks me that people are so resistant. Um, but I think I've, I think I've become more articulate. I think I've become more educated just by talking to people and learning. So I think I have changed my position in the society, I guess, than I was before. Yeah. Um, I have so many more questions, but Rob had such a great idea that we're going to shift gears a little bit. 
he asked if one of you would like to come up here and interview him for a few minutes. I think it would be a great opportunity to kind of change the conversation a bit. So think for just a second. <laughs> Is there, would you like to do it? All right, All right. come on up. I think we're I've gonna never get, done we're this gonna before. We're going to get personal really now. Yes, here yeah. we go. Good job. Thank you. Are you nervous? I'm just kidding. I'm nervous. <laughs> Um, my name is Shirley. Nice to meet nice you. Nice to meet you, Shirley. My name is Rob. Um, I'm just like I s went to the fluid um, store and I also went to the uh, website and everything. I was just I'm like really impressed by how you um, like have the concept behind all this like brand, like how you uh, like engage social conversation uh -huh. into this brand. I'm just wondering, like in general, what do you think that um, this like like us, the young designers should do if we also want to like be engaged in the social conversation ourselves? Yeah, I mean, my feeling is that designers and young people have, have a desire to be in this space, but there's so few places to do it. Um, I think we're the only one I think that actually does it. So if I were as a young designer and I wanted to be in this space, I would hang out of Fluid. I would join the ambassador program, which Jacob leads up. I would try to get as involved as possible and then one of the things we do is every season, we um, just started this, but we're doing our next one, we find a designer who designs um, in a non-binary space and we teach them how to put a line together. We give them a whole internship on designing, production, I give them a budget and I produce our line for them. And we launched our first one three weeks ago, which was Killer Called Them um, from three people from um, Philadelphia. Oh. It's fucking rad, it's like, you check it out, it's cool. And the next one is, it's a really interesting one. It, actually, we kind of it's um, Boomer Banks, who his name is Miguel, and he's uh, he's an adult film star and sex worker, and we're using his line. It's really cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's pretty cool. It's, it's, you just heard it here first, so yeah. <laughs> interesting. I'm I'm also like so just go on with your like question. Like I was like you talk a lot about like how the brand is actually like the mission and everything, but like, I'm just wondering, are all of this, like, m do you think like deeply done? Do you think it's more about, you want to make an influence to the society and to other people, or it's just like a, a marketing strategy? Yeah, it's a great question. It, um, it comes from purpose first, you know, mm -hmm. we're, we're a purpose-driven company. I will tell you, I, I like to say no to brands a lot when they come in and say, will you buy my brand? And I say, pull out your Instagram account, and I look at if it's skinny, pretty white people, I say no, <laughs> and then I'll, then I say, even if they get that far, I say, well, who do you give back to? And if they tell me they don't give back to anyone, then I say no, and ask them to come back when they've changed their, their reach to who their, their consumer base is, and that they give back themselves. So I love to say no to people. So it's more than just words in a marketing plan, it's actually, mm -hmm. I, I, want, I want the customer to walk into Fluid and know that I've done my work and my team's done their work to, filter out brands and designers that should or shouldn't be there. Mm. But it does make a good marketing story too. I don't know if yeah. anyone's listening, but, but it does. I, I think ultimately young people, you, you people, you know, will vote with your dollars eventually, not just on, you know, the cutest, cheapest fashion designs, but also companies that are coming with a purpose and not just backing in like, oh yeah, by the way, we make clothes and we also give back to this charity. I think, I think it's more than that. I think it's. I think you'll eventually weed out and understand who the authentic people are, the other brands that do this. And I have, I have faith in this country and this world because of young people, not because of the, the, the mess that we've created. Okay, that's cool. Um, I'm just because, uh, like, I'm my, my for my point of view, I'm like not really familiar with all the race and gender problems after uh, before I came to the U.S. I'm Where are you from? In China. China. Yes. You don't have those problems. Oh, we do, but like we hardly no, notice it. Like yeah. it's. it's well, it's been censored, I think. Yes, it's like okay. not as like we like we see uh, white people as foreigners. Yep. Rather than like race, so it's like guest. That's interesting. You know? Yeah. So it's not like there are different kind of people because it's like not from our country basically. Yeah. We think they are some like uh, white for, uh, like. 
people who is trying to yeah. be Chinese, and they are like some of them are uh, like are like that, but still we treat them like foreigners. Yep. So for me, it's like just all these kind of things, um, like all the LGBT group and everything is like kind of like a kind of new concept for me. Like when I come here. So when you are talking about like this um, gender-free issue um, and everything about it, I'm just wondering, do you also like, so is it more about like a, con like a context for um, America or do you think you no, want to I think engage? It's, I think it's for the world. I mean, I, for, as a world traveler, I see, I see it as an opportunity for every country to there's a different varying degrees. I mean, you go to like Netherlands or, you know, Denmark and it's very, I guess their fashion is really not fashion. So it's kind of neutralized from there. But, um, but it's, it's an issue all over the world. I, I mean, my goal is to be in 20 countries, 20 cities around the world mm. in a few years. Welcome That's, to China. <laughs> I'm going to be in China. Two, two of them are in China. One in Hong Kong and one in Shanghai. I think they're two of my most favorite cities in the world. Um, but I think Tokyo and Seoul would love this. Mm -hmm. um, I think about European cities like London and Berlin that would, you know, Paris. And I think like Toronto. And yeah, that's my plan. Okay. I, my plan is to be disruptive in a positive way in every city and make people think about gender and gender, I, gender expression, gender identity a different way. Mm. And if I can do it through this little corner in the, a city, then I'll do it. Mm, okay. Cool. Thank you. Let's see anybody else want to do a good job. Yes. Great job. You're good at this. Thank you. Thank you. Does anyone else have a question or two and be on the hot seat today? That's kind of fun for me. No? Well, let's Good job. Yeah, good let, job. Thank Great you. Questions. Yeah. Yeah. I was in the hot seat with you. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's open it up to questions from the rest of the audience. Uh, anyone have any questions? Questions or thoughts? Sometimes yeah. thoughts are good. All right, over here. Yeah. Well, let's use the mic if we can. Can you guys can you grab that for me? That way we capture it, capture it on video as well. You got to bloop out on my fucks. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I have a few of them at the library yeah. now. <laughs> Just Hi. make sure you turn it on. Okay. First off, I'm from Michigan, too. Um, second off, so I'm someone who definitely believes, like, a person who runs a company should, like, cap their, like, income, and their employees should have, like, a, like, cap, and then yep. if they're donating, like, they need to make sure that kind of stays that way, yep. and, like, they don't end up capitalizing more than they should on their, like, like, you know, concepts. So I'm wondering how you went about working all of that out. It's a great question. First of all, all my employees make more money than I do right now. That's awesome. Because <laughs> I, I respect that. Uh, you probably don't make anything. Because <laughs> I self I self funded the business, so okay. all of my money went into this business. Um, but you know, it's interesting as I as I grow. Like these are the things I think about. You know, how do I how do I not come across as monetizing, commercial, like capitalizing on something and exploiting people, even. You know, as Jacob knows, like, I have such a hard time paying for models because I want to pay models more than in you know, standard fare, but we can't, we can't do that right now. We're, we're small and nimble, and every dollar counts. <laughs> we literally are going sometimes month to month and surviving. Um, but then when I get into growth, the growth phase, what happens then? That's exactly what I'm thinking about. Like, how do I share this with the people that work with me? How do I... You know, everything and and everything I do in challenging boundaries with humanity is the way I want to structure the organization. When I start to get solid and founded, like what does that look like? And looking at other way other companies are structured doesn't give you the answer. It's like looking and changing the way it is. So that's exactly um, exactly the way I see it when I can get there. It's a great question, though. Really yeah, good question. Yeah, You're welcome. Awesome. Yeah, I've seen that not happen before, so it's really yeah. good to see that happen. <laughs> You know, it's it's so it's so interesting because there's well, right now in my career, like what I can I can and want to do are two different things. But when I get to the point where I have the choice, then it's really like how do I how do I make those choices? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. I have question. a question. Yeah, I have another one too. That I was just thinking about. There's there is such a wonderful queer community around fashion with Dapper Q and and Rainbow Fashion Week. Um, 
but in a, in a way, there's sort of this disconnect between the community that's really engaged in fashion on the queer side versus the more commercial side. And I'm just curious, like, how that, that's got to be sort of lots of conversation that's happening between these different groups. Is that, or how do you find that connection? I mean, the, you know, the, if you just identify like the queer culture, queer communities, it's so f segmented. I mean, yeah. you know, Depper Q started off as a, as a masculine expressive fashion show for women. And it's translated now like, you know, much, little more diverse, but not much so. Um, you know, but it is, it is the only queer fashion show. I think it's, and when you go to the Brooklyn Museum and see who shows up, it's probably 75% women of color. Mm -hmm. I'd say it's still, it's still don't see, you know, the gay boy, you know, group showing. I still, it doesn't, it doesn't exist. So it's like, it's still very fragmented and segmented. And I'm trying to like, in, in my small space, trying to like undo all that to have something for everyone. Yeah, it's a bit tribal in, that, in a way. Very yeah. tribal, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it is tribal for sure. And if you think about one of my favorite things, I had a, a woman speak about Stonewall 50 and she is a lesbian and she said when the police came and raided Stonewall, like she said, there we were taking care of our trans brothers, our trans sisters, our gay brothers, our gay sisters. And I thought, when does the gay culture and community get together like that anymore? And uh, as she spoke, I, there was an event on Thursday night, that was a Monday night, uh, Thursday night there was an event for trans women of color. And I encouraged all of these white men my age who have suffered through AIDS and the loss of your chosen family and certainly celebrating their lives and, and but I'm like if you really want to show up for the new people who have to survive um, daily life right now it's trans women of color who through suicide or murder are dying at a at a rate that's it, it's it's a it's an unbearable rate so if you really believe in the community show up for this event and not one of them showed up for the event not one of them showed up for the trans women of color which kind of blew me away yeah, it's unfortunate that that's still... So, yeah, so, like, oh, no, I showed up for my people and my friends, but, yeah. Yeah. Other questions? Yes. Hi. Hi. I think it's really cool what you're doing, and I think it's, like, a really great idea to have a safe space for people that would like to even experiment, and they're not sure, and they want to know how to, like, experiment with, like, playing with gender fluidity. Yep. And I think it's really important that we bring up these conversations because, like, I feel like a couple years ago, like, I didn't even know that it was, like, actually a thing and that, like, people, there was a community, actually. So I think that the fact that there's things like this is, like, society as a whole kind of taking a step forward. Yep. And, yeah. I, just, I feel like there's a big butt coming, you know? No, I was going <laughs> to I was gonna <laughs> ask a question, but I forgot. Yeah. Oh, the, I was going to say the genes I yep. was curious about. Because, like, I, I have several issues with, like, women's jeans, and, like, I haven't had a pair that, like, actually, like, fit me in, like, years. And have pockets. Yeah, and ha <laughs> but I, I was going to say, I, ha I tried on a p pair of my brother's yeah. jeans, and they, like, had pockets. They were awesome, but they still, like, weren't fitting me, like, you know. So funny you say that. So part of the process was I, I went and put on women's jeans and I bought the 7-Eleven Levi skinny jeans and I wore it for two weeks. And it was such a interesting experiment because the if, it, if no one has tried in women's jeans, the front pockets are that big. You can't even fit a lighter in there, it falls out. Your keys fall out. And then um, the zipper is this long, which if, you're, have, if you have male genitalia, you have to pull your pants all the way down to like go pee, which is kind of funny at a stall. But um, yeah, we solved for both of those issues. and. I don't think it's for everyone. I think it's a skinny jean. You know, this yeah. is the way we did it. So I think some people are going to go, my butt and thighs are not going to fit in this jean. But mm -hmm. try to, like, find as much recovery in the denim as possible. So I'm hoping most people can fit into it. But certainly not every person will be able to fit into it. Yeah, I get what you're saying. Yeah. I'm also curious. Like, I, I'm going to look through at your page and, like, visit the store. But I'm curious to see how you're going to make, like, clothing for all genders that's like equally like sexy and like yeah. liberating for everyone and like that's also like powerful and yep. stands out you know I think um I think that's the, the conversation we have all the time like how 
mask expressive we are versus femme expressive we are. And sometimes we fall into the space that's in the middle, which is like sporty, sporty spice. And it's mm-hmm. easier to do that. It's harder to get into suits and, and like tool and we're playing more in those extreme spaces where it feels like we can't play in it. Right. And, um, I don't think the website will be as, re- as reflective as a store will be because yeah. we're trying to get more product on the, on the website that's, that's selling in the store. I'm looking forward to seeing Looking forward to it, too. And, and I want your feedback as well. <laughs> All, right. All right. Thank you. You're do you welcome. find Thank that you have to help? Do you feel that there's customers who come into your store and they don't even know where to begin because they just never even had a place that was safe enough to come and ask questions like, I prefer a men's suit. How do I even start? Um, I think, and Jacob probably knows this better than I did since you spent like four months on the sales floor, but I think people come in and they're like, what is this? You know, and they start to wander and get comfortable with the idea. And then um, they either walk out, <laughs> like, this is not for me, or they, they try stuff on and some go really safe, like trying to champion sweatshirt or trying to feel a sweatpant. And then you get the people that, you know, put on a silk caftan that might not have tried it on before. Some people feel really comfortable with silk caftan and, you know, they put on big, chunky heels. And I haven't, I haven't figured out how to do a masculine expressive point of view we you know we did karen finch which is you know button front shirts if you have breasts um the challenge is the price point's like 120 dollars uh, it's a lot for a shirt but i think we might have to just suck it up and do it anyways we had a trunk show for them um it's always it's always we're trying to do different things all the time that's why we always have trunk shows and different designers because they come in they get to put their product on the floor and then we get to find out like what will sell and not sell in our space. What retails we sold yesterday? We sold a nine hundred fifty dollar fake leather coat from House of Fluff. Like when we do six thousand dollars a day, that was a big purchase. And um, I asked Jacob. I said, "Who was it?" Silas, who was here, and it was some woman who goes to the Upper East Side as a gay kid, and she's got a lot of money. So we told her to come back whenever she wants. <laughs> anytime, <baby. laughs> anytime. <laughs> Calm down. I wish she was my mom. <laughs> Another question here. Yeah. Hi. So I thought it was really interesting how you used like Burning Man and your shaman ceremony in Peru to influence your professional choices. In I'm life. glad you do. My husband doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm, I would love to do similar things and I've had experiences like that and I want to translate them to my professional life. Yep. So if you have any advice on that and also like how to keep yourself in check because I know after you have like something profound happen to you, it's really intense for a few months and then it begins to fade away and you can get caught up, especially in the fashion industry. It's really hard to keep like a level head and bring that like peace in with the work that you do. Yeah. So I'm curious it's, it's how you do that. Cause such I a great question. I mean, I'll be honest with you. We had on uh, my, my Burning Man friends had a shaman at my, our house. We have a weekend house and had a shaman there for six of them. And I went and visited them yesterday after they were done and they were feeling so raw and open and you know, your mind is expanded and I'm like, oh, now what do you do? Like, how do you go back into life and carry this with you? This like feeling of openness and vulnerability. And then you end up back in the world and, you know, bills are due and, you know, like deadlines are due. And you're like, how do, how do I live, you know, live my life? So there's a way to do it. I think it's about finding who your authentic self is and what you love to do. And there's, and, 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 I always say to people too, we're like, wow, I wish I could do what you do. I'm like, well, you make a million dollars. Like if you make a million dollars and give a lot of money to charity, that's awesome. Cause we need people to do that. You know, we need people to give to charities. We need people to make money to do it. As long as you're okay with it. I just found that, um, some people have a really hard time making money being their authentic selves, you know, cause it doesn't pay. Like I'm a poet, you know, that's great. <laughs> like how are you going to make money? So you got to be a barista and be a, a poet at the same time. I think it's, it's a dance. That's always hard to do. I'll always be there to talk to you if you want to talk about it. I haven't figured out how to make money doing it yet. <laughs> I haven't figured out how to spend money doing it. But, um, but there's something so rewarding about waking up every day knowing that I'm doing what I love doing and I feel like I've got a purpose in my life and, and that's immeasurable and can't put a price tag on that. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Other questions? Yeah. Marry somebody rich. That's the answer. Yeah. (laughs) 
Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, you mentioned how you were going to expand to more cities. Yep. I was wondering how you plan on tackling like less accepting diverse cities mm. around the world. Could that was the last part again? Like around the world, how do you plan on accepting like less diverse and accepting cities? <sighs> I love a challenge. Yeah, it's funny. Like I, well, the one model I want to work on, and I first of all I have to like you know get through December and build a website. That's our plan. We're actually doing a crowdfunding, launching a crowdfunding site this this week, so everyone will be able to go and donate, um, or not donate, invest money. I want to say invest because hopefully you're going to get a return on it, money. Um, but then we start. The goal is to start rolling out, and I want to first focus on North America and a few flagship stores. You know, it's funny because I get emails every day like, when are you going to open in Portland? When are you going to open in Memphis? When are you going to open in Jacksonville? And while that sounds like really great, it doesn't sound, it's, I think it would make companies go out of business like Sears by having too many stores all over the place. And so I would just do a few cities, select cities, and I think in every major city I want to go to will be a hub for people to travel from, you know, people come to us from Minneapolis and Philadelphia and West Virginia and Florida. So I'll have like, like locations that are, you can make it a destination if you go to that city. Um, but I think even if I ended up in, let's say, in India, I'd want to be in Delhi or Mumbai, which has most urban cities have, uh, you know, uh, openness and willingness to like check something out. But I probably wouldn't end up in Varanasi if I was in India. I think that would just be, uh, I don't know. <laughs> if anyone's been to Varanasi, it's beautiful, but it's not like uh, the place fluid would open up. But I would go with that urban setting, yeah. Well, and each place has got to be a bit different anyway, culturally. Like, there's certainly places in the world where there's a lot more fluidity in dress. I'm thinking of, like, Korea, for example, but it's not necessarily connected culturally. Well, well, that's what's so exciting about the concept of fluid, because 20% of our assortment is local designers and artists. And I think just how cool that would be to have a fluid product in every store, maybe some, like, exclusive brands from, like, Levi's, like, collaborations, and then have each community... Um, fill up their own artists and designers locally and just have that as a constant stream of newness and energy coming from that community. That's what I get most excited about. And it's very connected to sustainability as well. Exactly. We have time for one more question. Yes. Um, about like four years ago when I was in high school, one of my projects I tried to do like, um, well, I did do sort of like gender neutral based project but I was very you know my teachers they like I, it was very constrained and they were like you've got to do it like this because the market won't like that um, and you know when you're trying to get your grades you do have to listen to them to a certain level um, so I was kind of just wondering like what advice you have when mm. when you're in school it's difficult to break certain boundaries when it comes to because this is like an area that I'm interested in yep. and I've tried to you know, incorporating projects, but it's just quite difficult when, especially when you've got some teachers, you know, that have been, you respect them because they've been in the industry for a long time, yep, but they're not like open to as new ideas. Well, it's interesting because if I was, if I was graded, I would, I would never have passed to this point. You know, if I had every no I had, I listened to, I wouldn't get to this point. You know, if every time I did a focus group and asked people what they thought about fluid, there was 80% that was a stupid name. Um, <laughs> everyone said no along the way. But if I had a teacher, I have to figure out how to manage a grade, right? So I've got to figure out, I guess, where I can push and where I can't. If you could figure out a really open-minded teacher or professor, um, I would go in and sit down one-on-one and, and challenge them. I, I taught at FIT. I understand that some, some professors are really open-minded and some have been in this industry for a long time. I may not understand. So if it came down to my grade, I would do what got me a better grade. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> find, the t- find the professors who are open-minded. I think it's, I mean, I can tell you, this is a great university. And my experience has been that, um, th- just so you know, th- I have four speaking engagements at FIT in the next three months, not one at Parsons. Like Parsons doesn't even, flu is not even on the Parsons radar. And FIT has identified fluid, embraced fluid, visited fluid over the summer. Like, you just, the, the support from FIT has been um, 
really remarkable and I, I appreciate that. that. I just, this is a great university and you should all be proud to be a part of it. And most of our team is uh, FIT alum or students right now. Um, so you should give yourself a round of applause for being an awesome place. Hey, I like to hear that. I, I do want to say that, um, you know, every Saturday I sit in the store and I try not to make any appointments and just be there with customers and most awesome experience because I get to see people with families come in and, and um, sometimes I get emotional when I tell these stories, but like this um, two dads came in with their two kids and I walk up and like, my, my name is Rob, my pronouns he, him. And if one father says, my name's, let's say, Steve, and this is my son, their name is blank, and this is his best friend, this is their best friend, so-and-so, his name is this. And so it was two dads who brought their two kids, one is non-binary, one is binary, they're both 10 years old, but I thought, what a, what a beautiful thing to do to bring, to, for dads to bring their kids, and for the kids to be so accepting at 10 years old, and it just gave me, just made me feel really good, and I carry pronoun pins that I give out to them, and so everyone gets a pronoun pin. It just, there's a lot of stories like that and things that happen that way, but the one thing that I'm always surprised by, that we have a coffee shop and free Wi-Fi, when on Saturdays, I'm like, where's all the college kids? Like, why are college people not hanging out here, university people, when maybe you could be a think and it's dark and depressing, and we're bright and colorful with fun music, and I just wonder, like, when all the college people are going to show up, so... If you want to hang out on a Saturday, Sunday, do your homework, Flu is an awesome place to be. If I give extra credit, they'll come. Yeah, you got <laughs> and, and by the way, I'm going to pass out next time I come free coffee cards because we pass them out like a thousand of them. So we give out a free cup of coffee. Give 10% student discounts, so 10% off. Show your student ID. And it's a fun place to just hang out and be. You think you'll, think you'll, when you come, you'll appreciate it for what it is. One last question to sort of tie it all together uh, with a lot of design students, merchandisers, marketing. Is there just one sort of piece of advice you can give them to start thinking less binary, less gender, and, and sort of the power of that? First of all, challenge everything. Challenge your professors. Challenge the bathroom doors. I know you're doing a great job, Ron. Um, your head of diversity has spoken to me about it. I said, why well, was it even sarcastic? Like, like, where's your gendered bathrooms? And he's like, well, we do have some non-gendered bathrooms, so that's cool. But challenge everything. Challenge the lessons. Like, you know, Silas, who works for us, started off last year in men's design and has to start all over again because he moved to women's design. I had to start all over again. Like, that's fucked up, you know? Like, what's the difference? I don't understand. It just challenge professors, challenge the system, challenge the way people think and talk, and, um, and just start in small ways. But um, I don't know. Just question it because we're limiting people's potential. Potential kids, toys are more gender than ever before. We're limiting their potential for creativity, for ideas, the more we gender, the less we allow people to be themselves. So um, whatever you can do it, do it. Yes. Fluid is so much more fun. <laughs> <laughs> fluid, the future is fluid, we say. The future is fluid. I love it. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for coming today, Rob. Really, Absolutely. it was, it was a pleasure you. to have you. I really enjoyed it. Thank, thank you. you and I have free stickers if you want one. Come get one.